few things quite as exhilarating as driving around on a Tuesday morning while the weather's crappy and graffitiing other people's property. You make my dreams go. You don't need to be able to read it, you just need to be able to understand it. Hopefully these locators can figure it out. In all seriousness, I'm not just going around tagging other people's property. I'm marking the roads next to some of the new farms we picked up. There's tile holes and other dirt work we need to do. And before we do anything of that magnitude, break the surface at all, you want to have a locating service come out and make sure there's no utilities in that area. Because the last thing you want to do is get willy-nilly and go all gung-ho with the track hoe. And next thing you know, you're in heaven, or even worse, in a hospital bed with third degree burns all over your body. Even though I'm relatively certain that there are no utilities in this area, I just want to be safe because it either can cost you a lot of money or your life and there's really nothing that is that important that you can't take a couple days, mark the road, have some people come out, and make sure you're not digging to your death, financially or literally. Wow, look at this road. I think I'm gonna waste a couple minutes and explore. <laughs> That's probably the most exciting thing I'm gonna do today. I guess since the weather is less than pleasant, I'll revisit something on my list that I did about two years ago on both our planters that I found some faults in. Most of you probably were not here long enough to have seen when I installed the lights on the back of our planter CCS tanks to basically illuminate inside the tank so at nighttime you could see your sea level based on the shadow. Now, it was a good idea in theory, but in practice, it didn't exactly work out as I had imagined. Not that that's really all that surprising to some of you. Other than my shifty mounting system that really did not work that well, something that I did not account for is how these CCS tanks, because they're made of plastic, bow when they're loaded with seed. For this to work effectively, those lights need to stay flush against the tank, but when the tank's fully loaded, it bows out, and unless the light is directly attached to the tank and not to, a, say, a metal piece nearby, it's not going to be able to hold that form. And that happened to both of our planners. The light kind of shifted off and rendered it virtually ineffective. With that information now being known, really that puts us in a predicament because either I attach the lights to the tank, like directly to the plastic, or I put them inside, which would be the best solution in terms of effectiveness. However, both of those would require drilling into these tanks that are required to be airtight. Could put some grommets in there, seal them up, it wouldn't be a problem. But the owner of the planters doesn't really want them being drilled into, which I completely respect that decision. So we're just gonna repurpose the lights, add some lighting to the back, take them off. That way they're not just dangling there uselessly and we can get some more illumination at night. Last year at this time, I'd already been planting pretty much full speed for two or three days. Really a tale of two different seasons. According to my dad, there's another six inches of rain in the next 10 day forecast, maybe 14 day forecast, which is not looking good for planting season. Not ideal, but then again, we usually want to shoot for that mid-April range is kind of our average. Once we get into May though, that's concerning. Cross that bridge when it comes. Be pretty easy to forget that you need this nice, convenient 2630 display to put the back end of this planter down. And without it down on the ground, it's incredibly difficult to work on. Because I'm not super tall, and that has got quite a bit of elevation to get to the back. I'm not going to take the ram mount ball off just for the fact that I don't know whether or not I'm done with it. Is this in right? It's like having a more expensive and less useful iPad. Planter auxiliary, frame, plant, plant mode, unfold and switch. Now when I push the one SCV down, it should drop her down to the flow. And that's all I needed. I really did want these to work because they're such a great idea. When it's all said and done though, this is just not the way to do it. This set of quarter inch drive sockets is arguably the nicest investment I've made in tools this year. You never know when you're gonna need these smaller sizes, but it seems like when you do need them, you never have them. So I got a set. 
Who would have thought that hose clamps wouldn't make a good tie down system for these? Can you guys tell by chance which one was on the soybean planter and exposed to a violent hydraulic line burst? Mm. Tough to say. Oh great, immediately drops the nut. Are you kidding me, two times in a row? I believe if you drop the nut three times in a row, you have to quit. I don't make up the rules, I just think that's an official law somewhere. Now I just gotta wire them up real quick. Surely that'll be fast. I will say that that was a lot less stressful to put those lights on than it was to put those lights on because I wasn't trying to conform to any kind of secondary piece. I can spot one of my wiring jobs when I see one. Enough to get by, but certainly probably not enough to pass code. I better do a test run before I start to button all this up because if it doesn't work and I've already sealed it all together, I'm gonna be very frustrated. I'm working on the second planner now, and I'm not sure why Deer designed this this way, but they've made both the hot and the ground wire black, which is not very good for someone like myself who's already a halfway challenged electrician. So I got the voltimeter out, pulled some volts. This one was showing a decent amount when I would ground it to something, and this one wasn't showing much. So I'm assuming that's the hot wire. Really what that was, was a liability warning. If you ever get near my planter while the lights are on and you get shocked, I warned you. Okay, I've got another pair of lights installed on this planter. I'm hesitant, but I am going to go turn the lights on. If I was John Deere, I'd sell this option out of the factory, call it fancy back of the planter lights and upcharge you about $2,000. I've got a whole 60 bucks invested in this. I'm gonna get my truck out of the way, stop from blocking the barn doors, close it up. We're gonna see if this was even worth my time. They look pretty bright, but there's also plenty of light in there. It's really rather amazing. You put all this money on lights on your tractor, your planter, whatever, and it pales in comparison to even the natural light on an overcast, gloomy day. Yeah, not too shabby at all. Could I have done something more useful with my time today? Probably. Am I satisfied with my work? Yeah, pretty much. It's not really necessary to light every single ounce of the planter up. The tractor actually provides quite a bit of lighting if you can't tell. But I do believe both of them would benefit from another set of lights maybe in the vacuum area. Although I'd have to run my wires quite a bit longer because I don't believe there's any in there. And that's probably an unfold job as well. I'm probably gonna get a phone call from my dad next time he goes to start his 8310R. Andy, why is my tractor dead? I'm not quite sure he's gonna go for the, sorry, I was putting sweet lights on your planter excuse. Take this for whatever it's worth, but I saw a forecast today that's calling for four to five inches of rain over the next 14 days. It's really kind of giving me some 2009-esque vibes. Very wet planting season, I believe, we didn't even get started until the first week of May. If you couple a potential delayed planting season in the Midwest with already short planting intentions, I believe the USDA came out with some numbers last week or a few days ago, they're only projecting 89 million acres of corn versus the Chicago Board of Trade estimate, so the estimate of all of the analysts where they were thinking it was gonna be like 92 million. It's three million less acres. Soybeans hopped up a little bit. I think they went up about two million. And that goes back to that point I made a few videos ago that when inputs are very high, farmers are probably gonna pull back on corn acres and shift to bean acres. And it seems to be what's happening. Now, with all that being said, grain prices have gone up tremendously. New crop corn on the board just went over $7.15 today, which is absolutely ridiculous. That would be the December 22 contract. That's what people would sell for this upcoming harvest. I've not seen $7 new crop corn since we had a major weather event in probably 2012, but we haven't had a major weather event. I mean, a little scary here and there, but this is all tied to the global commodity shortages. Oh man, let me tell you, it has been a tough start to the morning here out at the farm. Of course, as is tradition, 
it's rainy again. Go figure, not like we were wanting to plant anytime soon. But I grabbed a roll of electrical tape on my way out because I needed to tie down all my connections. Forgot one yesterday. Doing that, got about three quarters of the way done. I made the mistake of cutting off a piece of electrical tape towards me, which I believe is against the rules of bladesmanship, if that's even a word. And I thought, you know what, let's see what a brand new box cutter blade feels like on your fingertip. And just to let you guys know, it's sharp and bleeds quite a bit. It's really not even enough to concern you, but if a stranger saw you on the street with blood all over your pants like this, they'd probably think you were crazy. Regardless, I just need to work up the courage to tape down two or three more fittings and the light job will be completely done. I apologize everyone, but I was wrong about all of our seed being in for the year. We do have a handful of Beck's seed bean boxes showing up this morning, and then that should round us off. I will give an honorable mention to Bex and Burris, who actually give us their beans in pro boxes, so these nice, hard, easy to use boxes, as opposed to Asgro, who gives us their beans in these terrific bulk bags. It seems a little bit backwards to me, because I would venture to say, purely speculating, that Asgro probably has the most operating margin on their products, because usually they own the IP of what they're selling. Gonna need a good choke this morning. <clears throat> Nice if you guys didn't leave a million things in the way every time you worked. to think that I'm talented at a lot of things. I'll be the first one to tell you though that driving a forklift is not one of them. I'm actually a rather horrific. Not even sure I'd last a day in a warehouse without getting canned. We unloaded the Vex beans here on the driveway just to save Ryan's time. He can get out of here. I'm gonna truck these all back to the barn slowly and coldly unfortunately because the weather right now is a little brisk. Not sure that I've ever been so joyful to complete a job. One, I'm bad in the forklift, and two, it's miserable outside with that wind. I want to talk about our soybeans a little bit this year and our herbicide technologies we're making use of. We've actually made a pretty significant shift in acreage towards Enlist soybeans versus Extend and Extend Flex. Historically, we've kept a pretty even split between Pioneer Asgro and then we sprinkle in some other varieties from different companies. Because of the problems with dicamba, unknown issues coming into this planting season, especially if it's going to be late, which it's looking like, and not to mention troublesome neighbors who have sensitive crops. We opted to pull back on our extend flex acres and move more to enlist. So we added some Don Mario's, some more Pioneer Enlist, and of course these Bex beans. The reason we didn't make use of the extend flex platform in that situation, which is supposed to bridge that gap, it has dicamba tolerance, but also glufosinate or Liberty, is that the price of Liberty right now to apply to one acre is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, no one in their sane mind, unless they just really love Liberty, it's not even that great of a herbicide, would wanna pay nearly $30 an acre for the chemical. That's crazy talk. $30 an acre is like a corn herbicide one pass system not something you spray on your beans that may or may not kill the water hemp. After looking through all of our yield data, independent yield data, thinking long and hard about what we're gonna do for this growing season, Dad and I kind of gathered that the Enlist platform or the 2,4-D tolerance 
was about the same, if not better, or just completely equal to the Extend platform. I personally don't think that either of those two genetic platforms are as good as the standard Extend only bean, but we wanted to maintain some Asgrow acres, so we kept Extend Flex, cut all of our Pioneer Extends, which were actually our best beans last year, went Enlist, that way we've got the convenience spraying Enlist. I haven't been disappointed, let's say the last few years we've planted Enlist beans. Last year was our first with Pioneer. We've been using Don Mario's Enlist beans for two years. They've been phenomenal. So I think the future is bright and hopefully not near as many gray hairs from trying to spray dicamba everywhere. Over the course of the last six months, maybe into last summer, I've rattled on and on about all the supply shortages. I know the focus has been on parts, new equipment, and fertilizer. Not near enough people though are talking about the real elephant in the room and that is herbicides. The herbicide market and supply chain right now is just completely derailed in worse shape than all of those added together and combined and multiplied by two. Just for the simple fact that our retailers around here do not even have enough of the products they need, Roundup, Liberty, other name brand chemicals to apply to fields this spring. If we were planning today, which was statistically not unlikely given our long-term prospects, they wouldn't have enough to spray all the stuff they need and that presents a very major hurdle that I, we don't know what's gonna happen. I think most of our product is bought, paid for, sitting on shelves in the warehouses at a retailers, but some people, if they show up and say, hey, I want this sprayed with this tomorrow, it may just be a too bad, so sad, we don't have it. That type of chemical shortage is not something that I have ever seen in my lifetime. Now, I haven't been around the sun as many of some of you have, but this is unprecedented and hopefully it doesn't hurt us in the long term. On to our next project. Cleaning out more grain bins over west. I'm not gonna complain about this one because it's really hard to be dissatisfied with having hundreds of thousands of bushels of unpriced corn to take to the elevator. Soon. I thought it'd be a cool day in hell to see this much rock unloaded over at this bin site, but we've got it here. This middle bin was starting to get a little bit off in terms of quality, kind of having a sour smell and some bad spots in it. Really wet out here, honestly too wet to be hauling out of this, so we brought in three or four loads of rock. We're getting these bins emptied and we'll move on to something else when we're done. The only thing worse than a bin of $3.50 corn going bad is a bin of $7.50 corn going bad. Time to go secure the sweep auger. <laughs> Loading and unloading those movable sweep augers really does make me appreciate the fully installed or fixed ones in our other big bins. However, I believe those are like a $15,000 option in a new bin, so for $15,000 a bin, I can do a little bit of manual labor. Since we move that sweep from bin to bin and not all of our bins are the same size, we have to add or subtract a few foot to fit the bins we're at. So we're unloading a 30 foot bin right now. It was set up to unload a 27 foot bin. We added two foot to get us kind of to the outside of the bin, maybe a 14 foot sweep auger. Should fit fine. The tradition continues. It is raining again. Unfortunate, but we gotta take what we're given. Take that back. It's not rain, it's sleet. Even worse. Check this out. I actually am organized for once. I probably should have done my due diligence this morning and checked the weather because I'm dressed for about a modest 50 degree day. It's 35 degrees, windy and sleeting right now. I'm not sure what's gonna quit first, the corn running out of the bin or me. All of that work and preparations and didn't even quit on this load, which means it'll almost certainly quit on the next one. Top of the door.
Now that, my friends, was the definition of a farm workout. It's like walking in quicksand with a couple hundred pounds in your hands. Oh, I think I'm gonna take a rest day from the gym. Unloading these bins is a slow grind when the original six inch out augers are probably worn down to a four. The power sweep is outpacing the center sump, but that's what we're working with. Usually about 2,500 bushel in this bin on the floor when it quits. We've pulled maybe a load and a half out. The real question is, will it fit on the truck? One load. Place your bets now. I think It'll be close to perfect, if not just a tiny bit too much. Chris and Jeff think it's gonna be more than one load, so let me know in the comments if you think it's gonna fit on a semi load. The reason that we were somewhat proactive to hurry over here into the mud and haul out of this bin site is because we had a few leaking spots, namely that vent right there, that hole in the roof, and then the door doesn't seal that well. Let moisture in and that kind of accumulated since harvest. We've had some warm weather and that really encourages microbial development. Microbial development seems to be an exponential growth. You start with a little bit and then you have a lot. And if you do not stay on top of it, it can spoil an entire bin. Now, you won't lose all your money if that happens, but you will certainly take a hit because you will not have grade two yellow corn. Here comes another round of sleet across the countryside. I'd almost rather be in the grain bin right now. And look at that snuck out of the bin with my bonus for the day. Big money right there. I've seemingly mastered this process of walking away with bit after bit of corn. I'll go back for the next load, which will be the last load of the day, and I'll just grab another bootful or two. And if I keep this up for, I don't know, 10 weeks in a row, should have about $5. I have to figure out whether or not it's all gonna go on. We do have a smidgen of corn left in there that we will get out probably tomorrow or sometime relatively soon. But for the most part, you can consider that bin cleaned out, which is a good sigh of relief for us because it was starting to go off grade in spots. I know you saw when I climbed in, you know, a few spots really didn't look the best. So you gotta be proactive, get them emptied or aired out or something. That way they don't spoil and you lose a lot of money in quality losses. I think I'm gonna end it for the day. I wish I had some exciting planting content for you or, you know, tractors and tillage and planting and all that jazz, but Unfortunately, I don't. The weather outside has not really been too splendid for planting. Completely different than last season. The forecast right now doesn't look like we're going to be in the field anytime soon. Although it is only the first week of April, second week of April. So we're really not behind. If anything, we haven't even hit the start date, technically speaking, on average. I appreciate you all tuning in. Like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more. And comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace!